morning. Glad that you joined us this morning for worship. We're going to invite you to stand as we begin our time together in singing this morning. sing this with us. Rumors of. Rumors of the sun.
us in Christ. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter.
take just a moment to let you be seated and just want to say welcome. Thank you for being here. We're excited about what God has for us today as we worship Him. And that's why we're here. We're here to worship Him. And we want our hearts to be changed. And we want to walk away with new conviction as we serve Him. So thank you for being here. Now we want to take a moment and dismiss our next kid worshipers. If you're here and you're participating, come on. You can come and line up right over here uh, against the wall. And that would be great. We want to give them a chance. If you're a, a, a parent who has not had uh, your child in this, you're welcome to go with them so that you can get them checked in and see where they're going to be. And they welcome you to do that. All right. Daniel, won't you continue to lead us? All right. We're going to invite you to stand as we continue to sing together this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. this with us. I was. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. From the far side of the chasm, you held me in your side. So you may. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross. Paid the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time, I had hope. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. blood. Thank you, Jesus. It has won.
I invite you to remain standing and to take your copy of God's Word and turn to Paul's letter to the Philippians, to chapter 3. And as you're finding that, I just want to think for a moment that we're singing and we're worshiping a real man this morning, a real guy that may speak with a Galilean accent, that has real DNA and fingerprints. It's not an idea, not a philosophy, but a real person. And that's what we're going to see to some degree here in what Paul talks about, that he wants to know Christ, not just conform to a set of ideas, but to know this real person and to become like him. So looking in, in Philippians 3, beginning at verse 1, this is what the Holy Spirit says through the Apostle Paul. In addition, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write to you again about this is no trouble for me and is a safeguard for you. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. Although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I've suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Let's go to him in prayer. Our Father, we praise you. You are holy and righteous and good. Lord, you rule over this world and over our lives, over our families, over this church. You rule over the forces of evil, and even they, they have a long leash. They can do nothing apart from your authority. Lord, we recognize that the evil is not just out there, but it is in us. And we have failed to love you as we should. We have failed to love one another as we should. And Lord, we deserve your justice. And you are a just God, but yet you are full of mercy. You love to treat sinners better than they deserve, and you sent your Son for us. Lord, thank you that 
though he had done no wrong, he stood condemned in our place and then offers us the gift of righteousness, his own righteousness to be put in our account. Lord, I pray this morning as we open your word that you would teach us, pray that you would empower Pastor Mark by your spirit to, to be clear, uh, to be uh, helpful, to build up your body. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the power of the spirit to listen. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. And Lord, may we not try to pin our hopes in our own righteousness or try to keep your approval and your favor and your love by being good, Lord, but resting in Christ alone. And may he be to us this morning a little bit more a treasure. Let us see that there's nothing greater than knowing him. And let us look forward to a hope of the resurrection, not just in disembodied spirits in heaven, but a real physical existence with Jesus and, and with your people, with sin removed. Lord, we pray for our children as they study your word as well. Let them see that they don't measure up to your law, that it is wise and good and shows your character, but Lord, they don't measure up and turn their hearts to love the truth and believe it and walk in your ways. Lord, thank you that you hear us when we call out as your people and you love to give good gifts to your children. So please give them now. We ask in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ben. Today we will continue in our series to put it into practice as we study through the, the book of Philippians verse by verse, uh, which is exciting to do because we really get to grasp its meaning and its understanding. And I really want us to be able to do that today, to put it into practice. You know, when I was growing up, I was told that practice makes perfect. How many of you were told that growing up? Practice makes perfect. You know, that's really not true. Are any of us perfect? We're not. Uh, practice makes perfect. Now, it may help your recall. It could help your performance. It helps you hone some skills. And, and there's some truth in that. And so practice isn't going to make us perfect, but spiritually speaking, practice allows us to apply the truth of God's Word so the truth of God's Word can do what it needs to do for us. But if we choose not to engage it, not to apply it, meaning we don't put it into practice, we can never understand why God's given us the truth. So we want to put it into practice. And that's exactly what Paul was trying to help the believers at Philippi with. Here in this text, we're going to see that there were some bad characters that were engaging the lives of the believers at Philippi. They had a motivation, and their motivation was to take them away from Christ, to have them go back to doing life the way these guys were doing it, and that was by their own strength and, and in their own deeds and in their religious ways. And so Paul steps in, and Paul loves the believers at Philippi. Their lives have been changed by Christ. His life has been changed by Christ. And so he wants them to think about this, understand this, and realize there's some bad characters trying to influence you this way, but please don't forget Christ and what he has done for you. And this is the only way. And so he wants to give them some truths that they need so they don't follow these guys and ruin their lives. Now, some of us here today may very well be on the verge of saying, there's something or someone that's influencing me, that's pulling me away from Christ. It may not be a religious practice. It could just be something pure evil um, out in the world that the world's offering and enticing you with. Or it could be something religious. Whatever it may be, the point is, it could be drawing you away from Christ. What Paul wants to say in the text today is, don't do it. Don't do it. Come back to Christ, for He is the only way. And that's what we want to hear today and in grasp. And so Paul makes five points that will be beneficial to us as it was to those at Philippi as they dealt with these bad characters that were trying to pull them away from Christ. We're going to look at the reminder that he gives them. We're going to look at the warning he gives them. Then the qualifiers, then the consideration, and then the desire. And these five things will take us through each of these verses so we can let the text come to life for us 
And these truths, we can put them into practice. So let's begin with the first of the five points that Paul brings forth, the reminder. This comes out of verse 1, and here's what it says. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Interesting way that he starts here. This is a a resounding, repetitive theme for him. Uh, Once again, we find Paul, the prisoner, uh, who could be saying, oh, it's terrible here and things are horrible. Instead, he's saying, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say, rejoice. And so he's reminding them again, no matter what your circumstances are, if you are rejoicing, you are worshiping. Now, everybody here, we all are in the midst of something different in our lives. Uh, We're going through different sets of circumstances. And so, so every one of us are listening to this truth, and we're taking it through a different life filter to say, how does it apply to me? Well, whatever it is you're going through, if you can, as he has said, rejoice in the Lord, what will happen is this, you can put it into proper perspective. See, what happens is the enemy wants us to not rejoice because when we fail to rejoice, we become discouraged um, and we allow the enemy to come in and and, and things turn negative. Um, What is the opposite of rejoicing? It's complaining, right? And we begin to sort of kind of in a way, complain. And we say, well, I wish things were different, and I wish this, and I wish that, and, and, and then it becomes, I can't believe this, and I'm mad about this, and, and ultimately leads us down this path where we get upset with God for the circumstances that we're in. And we end up doing everything with complaining and arguing. But didn't Paul say, do everything without complaining and arguing? And he did. And, and so, If we're failing to rejoice, we're we're going to fail to have our proper perspective. Now, the reason I'm honing in on this is because if that's the case, it's a dangerous cycle. Because when we fail to rejoice, we begin to complain. And when we begin to complain, negativity blurs our spiritual vision. And we don't see as Jesus wants us to see through his eyes. And then negativity grows into discouragement. And discouragement then can lead to bitterness. And bitterness can then lead to depression. And in a state of discouragement and depression, here's what happens. We find ourselves just just ever so much opening a crack to consider that maybe a different direction is a better direction. And that's the danger. And I think this is exactly why Paul said to the believers that at Philippi, listen, you, you've got to continue to rejoice. Don't open yourself up to these bad characters that have this false doctrine that they're bringing to you and they're calling you to follow. No matter your circumstances, you rejoice in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Jesus. See, we tend to think, well, maybe the world's got it right. Or maybe this religious system over here has got it right. Whatever it may be. I want to say to you today, nothing, nothing can compare to Jesus Christ, for He is the truth, and we got to make sure we're following Him. So this reminder to rejoice, it's not a bad thing. It is a needed thing. And you and I, we should get together, and we should encourage one another, and when someone else is down, we should get with them, and and not in an unrealistic way. Not that we downplay their circumstances, but we should help them get their eyes back on Jesus so they can rejoice in their circumstances and that the Lord can bring them through no matter what. And I want to do that for you today. I've had people do that for me. And and it, it changes everything. So the reminder was needed for them. It is needed for us that we rejoice in the Lord. This reminder is key. So... There's your reminder. If you get nothing else today, walk away and rejoice in the Lord. And it'll change everything for you. Secondly, he gives them a warning. Let's watch at the warning that he gives. He said, watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. Now, if there's one thing we want to practice, it's good exegesis. 
That is, interpreting the passage as it is intended to be interpreted. But do you know what eisegesis is? Anybody here know what eisegesis is? There may be a few people. That, if you don't know, let me tell you what eisegesis is. It is the very thing that Scott Phillips is going to be tempted to do when he reads this verse. And that is to put his own perspective on the verse. Because he's wearing his Georgia shirt today. He wants to say that it says in verse 2, God says, watch out for those dogs. That's eisegesis. And I don't want him going away from here saying, the pastor said, I'm telling you, the pastor preached a sermon Sunday that you better watch out for my dogs. No, I didn't. That is not what the text is saying. I understand the big game is tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, and both are 13 and 1. And people are going to interpret this in different ways. But that is not what the text is talking about. I'm sorry, Scott. I know you got your Georgia stuff on today. Proud. And many of you are. Uh, but there's some Alabama fans here, too, I know, that are proud. I know you're here, too. But listen. Listen to me. It's just as much as some people may want to say, yeah, watch out for the dogs. They're strong. They're going to do something, whatever. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not an expert in that arena. But here's what I do know. When he says, watch out for these dogs, you better watch out. Because they're a lot more dangerous than the Georgia Bulldogs. They are people who are out literally to call you down a path of destruction so that you destroy your life. Paul is saying, listen, watch out for men like this. They are men who do evil. In fact, they are mutilators of the flesh. They're saying you must do certain things in order to appease God. And they're saying those things you do are greater than what Jesus has done. You say, well, that's some kind of religious thing. Well, let me just say to you, the world says, come live this way, whatever it may be, and it's greater than Jesus Christ. There's not a difference. Now, there's religious sects that say, come do these things, and then you're going to be uh, in a better state. You don't have to trust just in Jesus. There's many ways. The Bible says there's only one way. It's through Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And that's what he says. And when you fully understand who Jesus is, that he's God, and he's God's son that came, and he died on the cross, and he took your sins, and he paid the price, and nothing can compare to the perfection of the very fact that there was no sin in him, and he gave his life, shed his blood for our sin, what in the world can we give? What in the world can we obtain? What can we do that is greater than that? Nothing. So why do we turn to so many other things? Because it's a temptation. And there's people out there offering these things. They're out there. They're dangerous. And the scripture says, listen, they are pure evil. They don't have your best interest in mind. They're not, they're not helping you grow. They can be both inside the church and outside the church. We need to run all influences that we are following through the filter of God's Word. And we need to ask the question, are they pulling me away from Christ or drawing me to Christ? I mean, just take that, that, that one statement, that one practice in your life, and it could revolutionize the direction of your life. What's filling you, what's guiding you, what your passion is. Is this drawing me to Christ or away from Christ. You think, well, this, this group of friends over here, mm, I don't know. Be honest with yourself. Are, are they drawing you into the things of the world? Or are they drawing you to Christ? You say, that person at work, uh, they're drawing me away from Christ. Then, yes, be a witness to them. But don't let them lead you. Right? The things you watch on TV... Michelle and I were watching TV, and there was a commercial that came across, and I said, Michelle, I just can't even take the 30 seconds of that commercial. Everything in that is pure evil. She goes, I agree. That is just horrible. And people watch things, and I don't know what that show is exactly, or, but I can tell you whatever the name of it was, it's terrible. And there's terrible things that we allow into our hearts and our minds, and really we're being led astray is what I'm trying to say to you. 
Don't take this text and say, oh, this is antiquated and these bad characters who are calling for circumcision as a way better than Christ. That's something I can't relate to. Listen, it's the principle of the fact whatever pulls us away from Christ. We've got to stay away from it. If you ride down a road and there's a bunch of potholes, what do you normally do? Are you right? I was, I was following a guy this morning here to church, and there was something in the road, and when he finally saw it, he swerved to miss it. It was a branch in the road, a branch or a pothole. How many of you ride down the road and go, oh boy, there's a pothole. I can't wait to hit it. Hit it hard as you can. Speed up. How many of us do that? Throw that car out of line. <laughs> See if the wheel will come off. Did we do that? No. We swerve. We try to get out of the way. We saw an accident the other day, and obviously a person swerved to miss a cat and caused a whole big pile up, and it was the officer was out in the road picking the animal up, taking it over to the side, and all the adults were crying. And it, you know, we avoid things, right? But yet we cannot see the spiritual potholes that are all around us, and we go, oh, that looks great. Let me just go try that. And we run over there and knock our lives out of line. We run over there and the wheels come off. And we go, oh man, what happened to my life? How did I end up? A Listen, it's, it's simple. It's a non-truth designed to destroy the life of the believer. Stay away from it. And that's what Paul is, he, he, he's trying to get their attention. And so now we move to number three, the qualifiers. So not only did he say they're wrong, but he, now he wants them to think about who's right. What are the indicators of who's right? And we see the qualifiers that come out as we read verses 3 through 6. Here's what he says. For it is we who are the circumcision. We who worship, here they are, by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. There's three of them right there. Now he gives a personal testimony, though I myself have reason for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. He said, let me just tell you about my own life. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, a Hebrew in regards to the law of Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Now you could dive into each one of those, and you could talk about them, and why people had respect for those, and thought those were something great. And Paul's going to lead them to understand and say it so clearly, they are nothing. But let's look at the three qualifiers. Worship by the Spirit of God. You know what that means? That means this is a person, as Paul was in all believers of the time, and even of us today, who is yielded, surrendered to the Holy Spirit that is at work within them. If you're worshiping by the Spirit, there is a yieldedness to the Holy Spirit that comes in and lives within us to lead you, guide you, convict you, uh, train you, turn the light of truth on for you, and you are open to that. And when we are, we're not doing religion by our choice, but we're allowing the Holy Spirit, our helper, to guide us into all truth. We become a testimony of what the true church is when the Holy Spirit's in control of us. It tells other people that Christ is first in our lives. It communicates that our salvation is in Christ not in any good deed that we could produce. And the evidence of that is the fact that the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding us. The second one he gives is this, that the, you glory in Christ Jesus. See, we put the focus on Christ. When you're doing it with deeds, you're putting the focus on yourself. And then the third is this, you put no confidence in the flesh. You're, true, you're choosing, listen, bottom line is, you're not trusting in anything you've done to impress God. There's nothing you can do. Jesus has done it all, and you've trusted in Him. And so you're not putting any confidence in the flesh. All these things he lists in verse 5 and 6 about himself, he said, listen, no confidence there for me. Not at all. It's all in Christ. And so those three are the markers of the real believer. You may be thinking, why is this so important? Why is this so important? Because you and I oftentimes are tempted to trust in our deeds, not the work of Christ for salvation. 
We like putting confidence in the flesh. In fact, you may be saved and you revert back to that instead of depending on the Lord. It's a, it's a, it's a huge tragedy, really, for the believer because you're missing out on what the Holy Spirit can do in and through you that you cannot do yourself. But you're saying, I'm going to do it myself. And then for those who don't know Christ, I mean, they're just missing out totally. See, there's a measure of comfort and confidence that's associated with generating religious deeds. It does something in us. It uh, makes us feel powerful and important. We can show other people that, hey, I'm competent. It gives us something to point to as an accomplishment. We all like to point to our accomplishments in life and say, look at what I did and, and look at what I'm doing. It allows for boasting. It gives us a place of influence and prominence among men for our own glory and renown. See, Paul, when he really got saved, he said, look, guys, it's nothing I've done. I can't take credit for anything. This is all Jesus Christ. And this is why he said, I will boast in Christ crucified. And he did because he got it. His life was changed. No longer was he making a name for himself through his hard work and his heritage. It was all about Jesus Christ. His conclusion will come that there's nothing that he could do of any value in God's economy. It was all Christ. Let me give you some tips on how to overcome yourself and your accomplishments, even if they fall within religious deeds. Number one, realize this. No matter what you do, it's never enough. It's never enough. You, you can't do enough. You can't overcome what Christ has done for us. Secondly, you should remember we're not worthy. We're saved by grace. And so what that does for us is it, it's not like God has to do something for us. He did it for us because he loved us. He first loved us. And we can receive that. That's grace. And then we should recognize uh, to point to and depend on our accomplishments and our deeds. Listen to me. You can take this to the bank. It's sin. It's sin we don't normally talk about. We say sin is lying, cheating, murder. We got a whole list of things. We don't like to crowd guys the fact that, hey, I'm over here and I'll let somebody know how great I am and all my accomplishments. You know what that is, though? That's stealing the glory of God. And so it's not about us. And it's sin when we make it about us. It's pride. And we put ourselves in a position where the Holy Spirit's not in control. The Holy Spirit can't lead us because we're leading ourselves. And it, what happens is we get all wound up and bound up in religious pride. And that's why we go around and then tell everybody else, you do it my way, and then you'll be as good as I am, and then we can both together, if we keep this up the way I say we ought to keep it up, then we can get to God. Paul's saying these guys preaching that doctrine are wrong. And he's trying to get them to understand this. And so what we need to do is repent, that is turn away from such an evil practice. You say, well, how do I, how do, I do that if that's a temptation to me? If I'm practicing that in some way, well, verses 7 through 9, Paul begins to lay out how he did it in his life as an illustration to them how they could do it and how you and I can do it. Look at the fourth thing we're considering here, and that is the consideration. And that word is based on, which we began to read verse 7, he says, but whatever is to my profit, I now consider. So there's a consideration going on here. Whatever is to my prophet, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Several things we should note here. Verse 7, he took an appraisal of his life. 
You should appraise your life. That means to determine its value and its worth. If you were to go get your car appraised today, it would probably appraise a lot higher than it did a couple of years ago. The used car market is, is going crazy. Um, it's hard to even find a new car to buy. But if you go and have your car appraised, you're going to find out that it has this incredible uptick in value. And because it's all upended because people can't get chips for the new cars and all the dynamic that's going on with that. But you understand that kind of like, okay, what's my car worth? What's the value of it? Okay, that's an appraisal. The same thing with your life. What is the value of your life, what you have? Paul did an appraisal of his life. He counted its value, and when he counted it, conviction occurred. And when the conviction occurred, it led him to conversion in his life because he realized that his life was trash compared to the treasure of Jesus Christ, that it was lost. But in Christ there was gain. He realized that he was a sinner and he needed a Savior. And Paul's life for Christ's life would define the great exchange. Because he looked at his life and realized his heritage, his hard work, his influence, whatever else. It was absolutely nothing, zero, compared to Christ. He saw it for what it was. Yes, that's what it takes to be saved. But sometimes after we're saved, we revert back to putting value on who we are. And when we do, we are pushing Christ to the side, devaluing what He's done for us, and we're not allowing Him to be the Lord of our lives, where the Holy Spirit's in control. We're depending on ourselves. Don't we evaluate things all the time? We look for the bigger piece of dessert. We Look for the better deal on a car, the, the better seat in the movie theater, the, the better parking place, whatever it may be. We're constantly valuing and thinking what is best for what I want. Well, see, Paul said, let's do that spiritually because that's what I did. And when I did that, I realized what I really want is Christ because everything I have is nothing compared to him. He goes on in verse 8, and he notes that everything, he adds this, not just some things, but he wants to make sure he covers it all, and he uses the word everything is a loss. And when we read that, we have to stop and think and say, hold on, wait, wait a minute now, does that mean everything? I, I can't enjoy the things God's given me in life, possessions, uh, uh, abilities? And, and the answer to that is no. You are to enjoy you are to use the things God's given you. He blesses you and meets your needs. He lavishes you with blessings. I'm not saying you don't enjoy those things. What I am saying is, though, you have to have them in proper perspective. Our contentment, what Paul, well, really what Paul's trying to say is this. Our contentment cannot come from things, personal abilities, position, or heritage. Our contentment and our purpose in life has to come from Jesus Christ. It means we're no longer trusting in anything else, but we're only trusting in Christ. That's the difference. And that's why he says everything. Now, see, it can trip you up and it can trip me up. It could be that there's a relationship in our life that just so ever so much we place it a little bit above Christ. It could be a child or a mate or a friend. And we look to them a little bit, you know, we don't really want to admit it, but we do. Nothing can be placed above Christ. Everything is below Him. It's a loss compared to the greatness of knowing Christ. And so he says in the second part of verse 8, to know Christ. Now this is important because we don't want to know just about Christ. We want to know Christ. I had a friend tell me recently about their experience they went snowmobiling i've never been snowmobiling but they began to explain it to me in these graphic details so it was really cold it was beautiful and all the snow in the woods and the in the mountains and in the speed of the machine and the experience of it all and i'm trying to imagine that yeah it sounds like something i'd like to do now i can know about it in its description but i've never personally experienced it but if i go and I get on a snowmobile, and, and I get to ride like that and 
feel the wind and the speed and the beauty of all that is taking place, that is very different than knowing about it and knowing it experientially, right? What Paul is saying is, I want to know Christ experientially. Now, now stop and think about this. Paul had knowledge of Christ before salvation, right? He understood clearly who he was persecuting and what they believed. He knew they believed he was the Messiah. He said, I'm going to persecute Christ. I'm going to persecute his church. But everything changed when he met Christ on the Damascus Road, right? He went from knowing about him to experiencing him. It changed everything about him, his goals, his desires, his passion in life. It allowed him to count and look at his life and realize it was all lost compared to the greatness of knowing Christ personally. What this reveals to me so clearly is this. To know Christ, which is Christianity, because Christ is Christianity, it is personal to you. He is a personal God. He's not something out there. He's not a concept. He's not, it's what Ben was talking about before he read the scripture. It's not some, something out there that we create in our minds or we know about. It's someone we know. Paul knew Christ who came and walked upon this earth as his Savior died upon a cross, was buried and rose again. It was his everything. It's personal. And there was a growing relationship with the risen Lord. As he said, I want to become like him. That is to know Christ, right? In John 10, he says, I know my sheep and they know me. Knowing always comes before doing. The problem is, these bad actors were saying, you do and if you do our way, maybe the right way, then maybe you'll know. But it doesn't work like that. It's by grace that we know him. We surrender everything. And as we come to know him, then we long to do for him. It's a natural desire. Typically, if we're not open to serving the Lord, if we're not open to walking under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, it's typically an indicator that somewhere our walk with Christ is not as it should be. Bottom line. Because we don't put forth the natural desire to serve Him and love Him no matter where we are. And that's when we can rejoice no matter our circumstances. When I was growing up, I loved to play basketball. I played in the backyard. I played down at the local park. I play in any gym that we could get to. We used to walk from gym to gym, and then back in the day, it didn't really matter. You just go, and they didn't really care if the gym was open. You found an open door, you went in, and you played. We walked all over our town doing that all summer. And I mean, we really had summer, you know, three and a half, almost four months. That's what we did and back then. Now, what do y'all get, like a week for summer or something like that? I don't know. It's something real short. I mean, we truly almost got close to four months. And we played basketball night and day. I mean, we practiced and, and we ran drills and we played one-on-one -on -one and two-on-two -two and three-on-three -three and five-on-five. -five. Boy, that was really good when you get that many people together. And we loved it. And we did it night and day because somebody was telling us to? No. It was just, it's just what we love to do. Now, I don't play basketball like that now. But there was a season, it was the natural desire of my heart. I talked about it, I, I experienced it, I, I, I woke up thinking about it, I went to bed thinking about it, I'd lay in the floor, anybody who plays basketball knows about this, I'd be in the house, laying in the floor, shooting the ball up to the ceiling. I'd run through the house and jump up and hit everything that was tall in the house. My mom said, you're going to destroy the house. Quit hitting everything and bouncing that ball. Go outside. I said, okay. And I'd go outside and play some basketball somewhere. Right? I loved it. It was a nat my, I'm telling you that simple little thing because nobody was forcing me to do it. And when we love Christ the way we're supposed to, we will serve Him, we will seek Him, we will honor Him, and it will be natural in our lives. Paul was exuding this. He wanted to know Christ, not because somebody was telling him he had to, to jump through the hoops. He'd already been down that road. He didn't need legalistic righteousness uh, through religion and heritage and all those things. No, no, this was a desire of his heart. 
And he says in the last part of verse 8 that he wanted to gain Christ. The whole deal was to gain Christ's righteousness. This wasn't him earning it. It was a gift that he would receive. In Christ, we have righteousness. We don't earn it. We don't earn it. We receive it. See, when Paul trusted Christ, he lost his own self-righteousness and he gained the righteousness of Christ. He looked at Christ's record and he saw that Christ was perfect. He saw that Christ was perfect. He saw what he did for him on the cross. And he trusted in Christ. And when he did, this is what you got to get. The righteousness of Christ, his perfection, his shedding of his blood for our sin, that righteousness is transferred over onto us. It's a transfer. It's a gift. You can't earn it. You, you can't, you're a sinner. You, you, he, he was without sin. You, you can't outdo him in some way. You can't do it. And so what he discovered was that his sins were paid for on the cross, and in that, the righteousness of Christ came on him. And he was forgiven. It's what we call the great exchange. It is loss of his life to gain the life of Christ that was given him. And it was personal. And then he notes, as great as all of this is, the way it happens is by faith. Verse 9. All of that truth becomes reality when we by faith trust in the work that Christ has done for us. I cannot save myself, but through Christ and the work on the cross, I receive it. It is a prayer of. It is an act of total dependence on Jesus to have relationship with Almighty God. That's it. Through Christ, we have access to our Creator, God. It's beautiful. It's powerful. It's everything. And faith is to believe it and trust it. And boy, does it change everything. The fifth thing I want you to see, the fifth point he makes are in the last two verses. Now, this is a powerful two verses that if you've not studied the verses we just studied, you can't even understand 10 and 11. He sounds like a crazy man to some degree. But when you understand it in its context, you get what the desire of his heart is. And here it is. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. If you don't understand why he came, why he died, why he was buried, why he rose again, what resurrection really is, you can't understand this statement that he gives. It's really Paul's passion statement. Why he desires this. And I want to say this to you. When you finally get to verse 10 and 11 and you live this way and you have this kind of overwhelming desire within you to know Christ like this, it determines the direction of your life. And when your life is in a direction for Christ, it will protect you from every worldly influence and every bad character that is out there. And what he was trying to get them to do was to live this way and in that surrendered state and the understanding of the, of the resurrection and His power and what Christ did for them and the great exchange and they can't do it, that then they would be surrendered. And in that surrender, they would see clearly that these guys, these bad characters, are evil and they're trying to destroy my life. And when you get that, you go, no, thank you. Uh, young people, you can say to those who are inviting you to live the way the world does, you can say, no, thank you. I know who I am in Christ. I know the desire of my heart. I know the passion of my heart. See? And you're okay because you know who you are in Christ. And it changes everything. This is why we need to understand the importance of passion. Paul was passionate here. It raises the question, what is the burning desire of your heart? What drives you? What motivates you? What gets you up out of bed in the morning? What do you think about throughout the day? What do you talk about? What do you participate in? All of these questions get to the heart of the matter, the matter of the heart. It reveals our passion. 
if we're lacking in our passion for Christ, I don't know any other way to say it. It's one of two things. Either you've never really known Christ personally, you know about him, but you're not really saved. Or, as a saved individual, you've been led astray. Other things are filling your heart, but not the passion for Christ to know him. It's one of the other. The question is, which one is it? I want to say in closing, Paul knew there was no power in the law. He tried that. It couldn't overcome sin. It didn't give him the ability to serve God or be a witness. But when he experienced resurrection power, he said this, listen, I realized when I experienced that resurrection power, it overcame death. Wow. It overcame demons. It overcomes the world and the flesh. I mean, it, 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 changed, it changed everything for him. And that's what saved me. And what saved me, that power that saved me, listen, it's the power I want to live by. Not just be saved by, I want to live in its reality. That's what verse 10 and 11 are talking about. I want to live this way. How many of us are just coming up short because we filled our hearts with a bunch of bad characters and their influence? Instead of being so focused and surrendered to Christ that we are filled with this power, the power of the resurrection that saved us and that we live by. Isn't that what it's all about? It is. Let's think about this for a second. Say I'm told that I have a terminal disease. And I'm giving a certain amount of hours to live. In those last hours, before I pass away, I think, well, maybe I should give some consideration to my life. Let me list out everything that I have. Here are my possessions, my home, my car, uh, things that I own. All those things that could be said. Mark owns these. They're his. Let's list them all out. Then let me list out all my relationships. My wife, Michelle, and my family members, and my kids. And list all relationships, all possessions, and let's list them all out. I'm down to an hour to live. Now let's put those up against Jesus Christ, Mark's Savior. When I take my last breath, we got a column of everything Mark has here on earth, everything that Jesus Christ is to Mark. Which one will make the difference? Which one? It's Christ. <laughs> you, you, you can't take your people with you. You can't take your possessions with you. But what you can take with you is your Savior. The resurrected Savior that overcame death. So when I take my last breath, I am confident based on God's Word without a doubt, in Christ, who overcame death, who overcame sin, that I have no fear of what's on the other side of my last breath. It'll be my Savior who loves me and knows me that has been testified in my life. Now let me tell you something. Some people die with that confidence. Some people die struggling, trying to hold on to the things of this earth or come up with things that they're going to say to God before they stand before Him. But nothing compares to Jesus Christ, my Savior. Nothing. So if that's true in the end, and it was true for my beginning, it ought to be true in the middle every day of my life. That's what Paul was saying. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.